Thank you for joining us, especially after this being rescheduled on short notice. My name is Allison Bell, and I'm a senior housing program specialist in the Office of Public and Indian Housing and the Housing Voucher Management and Operations Division. I'm joined today by my colleague, Brendan Goodwin, and today is the first of three webinars in our housing mobility series. So today we'll be providing an overview of the community choice demonstration, which you may also know as the housing choice voucher or mobility demonstration. And Brendan and I jointly help manage the community choice demonstration for PIH. Today's webinar is being recorded and the slides will be made available. The website location of where the webinar and slide posting will be uh, posted uh, will be in the chat momentarily. And we welcome questions in the chat throughout this webinar um, that we will get to at, at the end. So I'm going to briefly go over our agenda for today. So first I'm gonna provide an overview of this housing mobility webinar series and an upcoming notice of funding opportunity. Then I'll provide some background on the community choice demonstration, the purpose of housing mobility programs generally, and then the specifics of the community choice demonstration program design and services. And then we'll talk a little bit more about our plans to share the lessons learned from this demonstration uh, more broadly. Sorry, the wrong button there. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be sharing information about housing mobility. So today is the first in our webinar series, and we're gonna focus on the community choice demonstration. Next Tuesday at 3 p.m. Eastern, we'll be sharing some insights on things you might wanna consider if you're thinking about launching a housing mobility program. And then on Friday, July 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, we'll be sharing more details on what exactly mobility related services are. And today I'm gonna to briefly touch on the services being offered in the demonstration, but on July 8th, you'll hear a lot more about how these work in practice. And so you can join each of these webinars without registering first, and you can find the recordings and slides for these webinars online. Um, to join the webinar and to access the recording and slides, you just go to our HCB training and resources website. Um, the link is on the slide here, but we're also going to be putting it in the chat. So we hope this information we are sharing is timely, as we know many PHAs might be interested in an upcoming funding opportunity related to housing mobility. So the fiscal year 2022 appropriations bill, which passed in March of this year, provided 25 million in new funding for mobility related services. And HUD anticipates publishing a notice of funding opportunity in March of 2023. And that NOFO, the notice of funding of funding opportunity is called a NOFO. The, that NOFO will describe how PHAs can apply for this newly available funding. And as you can see here, there's an excerpt of the appropriations bill language, and it requires that the funds go to for um, mobility related services as defined by the secretary for voucher families with children modeled after services provided in connection with the mobility demonstration. And so these funds will be made available on a competitive basis to PHAs, and the appropriations bill requires HUD to give preference to PHAs with higher concentrations of voucher holders with children residing in high poverty neighborhoods. And we know that March 2023 is a ways off, but we hope that PHAs that are interested uh, keep an eye out for it next year. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the background of the community choice demonstration. So many of you may know the community choice demonstration as the HCB mobility demonstration, but community choice demonstration or CCD is what we'll be calling it going forward. And so this was funded by Congress in fiscal years 2019 and 2020 for a total of $50 million. And so 10 million of these funds are for new vouchers for families with children, but the vast majority of the funding or 40 million of it was for mobility related services. So a significant amount of funding is for direct services 
to help families access areas of opportunity. Um, at the bottom of the slide, and we'll put it in the chat too, um, you can see the website for the community choice demonstration if you want to read a bit more about it. And so the goals of the demonstration are to help families with children access areas of opportunity and to learn what works best at helping families access opportunity, sorry, access areas of opportunity and remain in those communities. So back in July of 2020, HUD released a funding competition notice for PHAs who were interested in applying for the demonstration. And you can still see a copy of that notice and related materials on the community choice demonstration website. And HUD received 28 applications in February of 2021 um, for the demonstration and made nine awards in late April of 2021. And some of those awards were joint awards. So some of the sites are um, have more than one PHA participating and they're working in partnership with each other. So each, each of the nine sites was awarded 74 new vouchers and received about $4 million in services funding. And they'll be providing mobility related services with this funding over the course of the next five years to about 10,000 families of children. And so one thing that's pretty unique about this demonstration is that the vast majority of those 10,000 families that receive services will be current voucher holders, meaning the program is largely targeted to current program participants that are interested in moving with their voucher. Um, some programs, especially the Creating Moves to Opportunity program you may have heard about in Seattle and King County, focus their services on new admissions from the waiting list. So here you can see a map of the originally awarded sites, and you can see quite a bit of diversity just off the bat among the sites geographically, the size of the region, the number of vouchers they have, the housing market types, and other characteristics. So we're pretty excited to see how mobility related services work in a variety of contexts and think that will really help us learn a lot about these programs and how they can best help families with kids access a broader range of communities. So right now we're coming to the tail end of our planning phase. And so Congress required an evaluation of the demonstration and we um, selected an evaluator to do an independent evaluation. And that's going to include a randomized control trial along with a qualitative analysis and a cost study. And so a randomized control trial or an RCT is generally understood to be one of the most reliable research methods to study the impacts of a treatment by isolating the effects of that treatment by comparing it to a randomly assigned treatment group against a randomly assigned control group. So in, in an RCT, the treatment group and control group should be as similar as possible to better understand the impacts of the treatment. And so to do an effective RCT, um, the PHAs participating in the demonstration are going to be implementing substantially the same set of mobility related services. And this will allow us to test how similar services are effective in very different contexts. So we've had quite an undertaking in this planning period and the participating PHAs have a really amazing job at thoughtfully this really big research project along with standing up a brand new program in the middle of a pandemic. So um, we uh, have been working really hard throughout this planning phase. Um, but during this phase, uh, HUD, including HUD PIH, HUD PDNR, um, HUD's Policy Development and Research Office, along with the evaluation team and our technical assistance provider have been working really closely with each of the selected sites to prepare as best as we all can um, for the PHAs to deliver services and launch the research evaluation. So the demo is pretty large scale as far as demonstrations go. Um, there's a total of 12 PHAs involved, uh, two offices at HUD, a technical assistance provider, and a research evaluator, along with when um, services begin, a lot of families. Um, so we each have a different role and responsibility for implementing this demonstration. And so as you can see here, the PHAs are at the center of the demonstration. They're the ones that are gonna be working directly with families 
implementing mobility programs and participating in the research implementation. And HUD PIH's responsibility is around program policies, funding and regulatory oversight. Um, our partner office that so we've been working really closely with PDNR, they sponsor the evaluation and they're pro providing oversight for that. And then we have a technical assistance provider, First Pick, that's been working really closely with the PHAs to assist with best practices and development of program materials. And we're also working with APT Associates, who is the selected um, independent evaluator. So, as I mentioned, um, PHAs are going to be offering services for about five years. And so you can see in this chart, the total demonstration period is six years with the first year being the planning period I mentioned that we're in right now. And we're also going to start enrolling families very soon into a pilot, which I'll talk about in just a second. And so there's two different sets of services that are gonna be tested that you can see here in this chart. Um, so in the first two years of service delivery, all of the PHAs are gonna be offering substantially the same set of comprehensive mobility related services, or we shorthand it CMRS, and this is essentially a kitchen sink approach to helping families access opportunity areas. And I'll talk a little bit more about what all is in the CMRS. And then in the last few years of the demonstration, each site will continue to offer the CMRS, but they'll be adding in a second set of services to test known as the Selected Mobility Related Services or SMRS. And so here we're gonna be testing individual components of the CMRS to see if, there, if a subset of them might be a more cost effective approach at helping families access opportunity areas. So we haven't determined yet what the SMRS will include, um, but just as an example, this is not exactly what we'll do, we don't know yet, but as an example, um, it could be something like one site would test pre-move ser services only, and they wouldn't implement post-move services. And we would be able to see how effective post-move services were compared to a site that didn't do um, post-move services. So we aren't planning to decide on what the SMRS will be until we have a bit more experience implementing the CMRS and get a lot of feedback from um, the sites that are participating and make sure we uh, take all of their ideas into account. Um, at the end of the study, we estimate that about 6,000 families received CMRS services, about 3,400 received SMRS services, and 6,000 families were assigned to the control group, which means they just received the regular set of services. The PHA's regular HCV program, they didn't receive the special mobility services. So some of the PHA's selected for the demonstration, demonstration previously administered mobility programs, but many did not. And in any case, um, none were trying to do a full scale randomized control trial research evaluation at the same time. So we always knew we'd need to have this robust planning and pilot period to give sites the tools and time they needed to be successful um, to successfully implement this program over five years. So as this planning period comes to an end, each site is going to begin what we're calling a pilot. And you could think of it as a soft launch or a dry run. Um, but the main purpose is really just to make sure that all the planning we've um, been doing works in reality. So PHAs will actually start enrolling families into the study once they start their pilot period, but at a reduced rate than they will during the full implementation period. We also will have enhanced technical assistance and research support during this pilot period to closely monitor and tweak how everything is working in practice. So we'll be paying really close attention to how recruitment and enrollment of families into the program is working, how service delivery is working. Um, the evaluator also developed a case management tool for each site to use, known as a service delivery tool. So we will be working the bugs out of that as well. And PHAs will be looking at, you know, how well do their move processes work, um, other administrative policies, and coordinating if they're a joint site among PHAs. So it's really an opportunity to kind of test out all these things we've been planning for before we launch into full-scale implementation. So we think right now that the first four sites will start their pilots in August, and we're really looking forward to getting started. Each um, PHA, as I mentioned, has been working tremendously hard, and it's gonna be really great to see them actually start working with families and meeting the goals they set out for their PHA and their region 
about two years ago when they first started thinking about applying for this program. So I covered a little bit about the history and status of the community choice demonstration, and I'm going to talk a bit about why some communities have adopted mobility programs and why Congress and others have taken such an interest in having more communities implement programs. But first, I wanted to define what we mean by mobility program, which maybe I should have done a little bit earlier. Um, but these programs help reduce barriers for families with vouchers to live in neighborhoods of their choice, including opportunity areas with high performing schools, access to jobs, lower crime, parks and other amenities that you that you can think of. These programs generally include a comprehensive set of services offered to families, as well as administrative policy changes like high enough payment standards and extended voucher search times. So, although there's no universally agreed upon definition of a housing mobility program, these programs often include mobility related services, such as pre and post move supports, family financial assistance, like security deposits or application fees, landlord outreach and housing search assistance. So sometimes when we talk about mobility programs, it can seem we're putting too harsh of a critique on the voucher program. Um, so I just want to, I would like to remind folks that the program currently houses over 2.2 million families, which include 5.2 million people and helps them rent in the private market using a voucher. So there's certainly challenges and barriers, but the voucher program does a really great job at helping as many families stay housed. That said that we do know that families with children using their voucher tend to live in higher poverty communities with that voucher. So there's about 958,000 families with kids in the program. And of those only 13% live in what we would call or typically call low poverty neighborhoods, which are neighborhoods with less than 10% poverty rate. As many families live in low poverty neighborhoods as live in extreme poverty neighborhoods where the poverty rate is over 40%. And then the median poverty rate for HCV families with kids is like 23%. So, as you can see from these maps of St. Louis, which we are just using as an example, not to pick on St. Louis, um, this pattern plays out uh, in city after city all over the country. So, this is not just unique to St. Louis, but our technical systems provider created this beautiful map. And so I am um, using it today to illustrate this point. So, on the map, on the left, the blue dots, which represent voucher holders, you can see where they live. And so one thing to note is the metro area is really pretty big, and you can see that the cluster, the, the voucher holders are clustered instead of being more spread out like you might expect in such a large area. And then you look at the two maps on the right, and you can see that the areas in red to yellow are higher income areas, and those are areas where voucher families do not live. And this pattern is typical. So you might ask, why do these patterns exist? So we'll talk a bit about very briefly about the academic research um, in just a minute. But I also wanted to briefly highlight um, some of the challenges families face when looking for a rental unit, especially one in an opportunity neighborhood. So by providing additional supports to families, mobility programs help address these barriers and assist families in being able to select from a broader range of rental units than are typically available to them under the voucher program. So there's many factors that exist outside of the HCV program that can impact a family's ability to lease a unit where they want to. So when a family goes to use their voucher, sometimes they're up against a lot of structural forces that can make it hard to select from a wide range of housing options. So these can include discrimination from property owners or other types of historical and present day policies that can perpetuate racial and economic segregation. There might also be a lack of affordable housing supply and in middle income neighborhoods. Maybe there's larger social effects that can make sometimes um, voucher holders less competitive in the rental market. And then PHAs are always contending with fluctuating funding levels that can make it challenging to um, provide additional services to help families search for units or provide additional financial assistance.
And then there's um, challenges that are more a part of the, like that exists within the voucher program. So sometimes payment standards aren't high enough in opportunity areas, which makes it hard to lease there. Our landlords might not want to work at the program because of too much bureaucracy and paperwork, or maybe they've got a stigma against the PHA and its families. And then there's just um, the, the plain fact that moving is expensive. So if a family applies to a lot of places um, as well, that's, that's also expensive. So potentially getting rejected uh, for every application that you turn in is cost prohibitive at even thinking about moving somewhere else. So there's a lot of factors um, here that can uh, make it more challenging to find a rental unit in a, in a new neighborhood. Then there's issues that tenants face directly um, or more directly, like perhaps they have an uncompetitive rental application because they might have a lower credit score. Or maybe they don't have a lot of information about renting in an opportunity neighborhood or um, Maybe while they want to move to a certain school district for their kids, they have conflicting priorities to balance. Um, and then some families have concerns about what life might be like in a new neighborhood. So you may be asking, what does it really matter even though there's all these issues, what does it matter what neighborhoods families have access to? And how much do these barriers really come into play? And how much is really about just that families are choosing to live in higher poverty neighborhoods? Um, well, researchers at Harvard University, led by Rush Teddy and, um, and others, sought to find answers to those questions. So, first, the researchers re looked at the moving to opportunity or MTO experiment, which is among the most well known housing mobility interventions. So MTO was authorized by Congress in 1992 and made use of housing choice vouchers in combination with housing search and counseling services to assist low income families to move from some of America's most distressed urban neighborhoods to lower poverty communities. And it was a rigorous multi decade comparison of low income families who used vouchers to relocate to low poverty neighborhoods with similar families that remained in public housing developments. And some of the initial MTO studies found limited impacts on adults, employment outcomes, and increased earnings. <clears throat> but they did find that living in low poverty neighborhoods have a strong positive impact on adults' physical and mental health. So, for example, families that moved to a low poverty neighborhood had less depression and rated themselves as happier. And it also was found to have health impacts of so families that moved with the voucher had lower rates of extreme obesity and diabetes. Um, then in 2015, a group of Harvard researchers uh, led by Raj Chetty re-looked at this MTO data specifically on what happened to the children who moved as part of the demonstration and what they found was pretty remarkable. So they looked at adult outcomes for children who were younger than 13 when their families entered the demonstration. And they found that young boys and girls and families that used a voucher to move to lower poverty neighborhoods were 30% more likely to attend college and earn 31% are nearly $3,500 a year, more as young adults than their counterparts and families that didn't receive an MTO vouchers, voucher. And girls and families that moved to lower poverty neighborhoods were also 30% less likely to be single parents as adults. And um, they found that these neighborhood effects were cumulative. This study found that the longer children lived in better neighborhoods, so long, like that's the younger they were when their families moved, the larger the gains as adults. And so these important findings um, reinforce similar results obtained in a separate Chetty led study analyzing IRS records of a much larger sample of children and families that moved across county lines. And so these results helped inspire um, the Chetty team to partner with the Seattle and King County housing authorities to do a randomized control trial there to see if housing mobility programs work. And especially to find out if families self select into higher poverty neighborhoods or if barriers in the market and HCV program are why families end up in higher poverty neighborhoods. So, the researchers sought to uncover whether families with vouchers faced barriers that prevented them from moving to opportunity areas or if families prefer to live in neighborhoods that offer limited opportunities for upward mobility. 
And so to answer these questions, the Seattle Housing Authority and King County Housing Authority, they implement, implemented a randomized control trial. And they offered a set of housing mobility related services to families in a treatment group and business as usual services to families in a control group. So, similar to what HUD is planning to undertake in the community choice demonstration. So, as you can see from this chart um, in that gray bar, 15.1% of families in the control group are families that just received normal HCB business as usual services moved to opportunity areas. And as you can see in the blue green there that that bar uh 53 percent of families that received mobility services moved to opportunity areas so based on these results the researchers um concluded that it is not it really is not necessarily family preference to stay in higher poverty neighborhoods and that when given the tools and information to access a broader range of neighborhoods a lot more families will choose to move to those areas so the community choice demonstration is building on this Seattle King County experiment, including doing a similar randomized control trial. So bringing it back to the community choice demonstration a bit, we're gonna talk about how this program, the community choice demonstration program will help voucher families access areas of opportunity. So, as I mentioned, um, 9 PHA sites are implementing the demonstration. And at each site the program, there will employ approximately 4 staff to work with families directly. So, they'll be providing direct services. Um, about half of the PHAs have ended up contracting out their services and the other half will be administering the services directly as the PHAs. Um, oops. Sorry, lost my, my mouse there. Um, so in general, they're going to have about 4 staff offering services to participating families. Um, but the PHAs were able to structure their services according to their, their, their staffing needs. Um, sorry, they were able to construct their staffing needs um, on an individualized basis. So, um, families can participate in as much or as little of the services they want. So, the program is going to offer all of the available services to each family, but the family does not have to participate in any of them, or the family can participate in all of them. So, the services are really customized to the individual family need. It's not a one size fit all situation for uh, families in, that will be getting services. And the program is really aimed to focus on family strengths and goals. And so all of the staff are going to be trained in a technique called motivational interviewing um, that will be threaded throughout all of their service provision to focus about to focus on what the family really wants to achieve for themselves and how to help them get there. And I should note families do not have to move to an opportunity area. Um, but they're encouraged to participate only in the program if they're open to that idea. So it's not a requirement to move to an opportunity area to, to participate and to receive the services. They just have to be uh, open to the idea of an opportunity area move. And so each PHA participating in the demonstration also has to adopt certain administrative policies uh, for their voucher program. Because as we discussed, sometimes there are barriers in the voucher program that need to be addressed. So each PHA will have adequate payment standards and opportunity areas so that these areas are truly accessible and affordable to families. And each PHA has committed to ensuring that inspections are conducted timely and that the overall lease up process is timely as well. And additionally, each PHA had to adopt a, a special waiting list preference for families coming off the waiting list. And so this is for families with um, at least one child, age 13, and um, age under 13, living in a high poverty census tract. And so this is just a waiting list preference for the limited number of new admissions from the waiting list um, that will be participating. But the program itself allows any family with at least one child under age 18 to participate. 
Um, and again, the vast majority of participants in this program will be families already on the program and not families coming from the waiting list. And um, one other thing for PHAs that are operating jointly, they've also had to work together to figure out how to coordinate their policies and procedures to make sure that the program is uh, pretty similarly uh, operated. So one thing people always want to know is, well, how are you, how are you defining opportunity? And um, each PHA has worked really closely with HUD, uh, the research evaluator, um, and the research evaluator to develop what the definition of opportunity areas are in their operating area. So when each PHA applied, they proposed an opportunity area definition in their application. And the evaluator analyzed their definition um, that the PHAs proposed according to some key metrics and some conventional measures of opportunity. So there's a number of opportunity area indices out there or, or indicators of opportunity. And so the evaluator looked at, at those compared against what the PHA approached. And then we developed, um, the evaluator did some Minimum criteria for the census tracts to be defined as an opportunity area, including a, a maximum poverty rate a maximum amount of assisted housing already in that census tract. Um, and a minimum school performance. And so the evaluator created a final proposal or probably should call it a draft proposal and. and uh, shared it with the sites and discussed with them their methodology and then the sites were able to take a look at that and. Um, make recommendations of uh, changes that should be made to the definition or the, the setting of the opportunity areas by tract to take into account local um, considerations. They, uh, the PHAs know their neighborhoods better than any sort of data analysis can, can tell you. So there was an opportunity to customize the opportunity areas by census tract at each individual site based on the um, data and knowledge of each individual participating PHA. So the opportunity definitions were not one size fit all. There was a minimum criteria that had to be considered, but each PHA was able to work with the evaluator to come up with a, a final set uh, based on local considerations as well. So I know um, this slide has some tiny print, my apologies, um, but what it is showing is Part of this theory of change summary that our technical assistance provider really helped um, lead and create. <clears throat> and this was developed to help determine what services should be offered as part of the comprehensive mobility related services. Um, so to develop the set of services, HUD and the technical assistance provider worked directly with the PHA sites, uh, you know, starting with their applications and looking at best practices to really try and identify what um, services might be most beneficial at helping families access areas of opportunity. Um, but we wanted to make sure that each service offering was really related back to one of the challenges that we're trying to solve or the issue area, as you can see it called here. And we also wanted to know what our expected outcome for how the services would resolve that challenge. So for example, we know that families face a number of financial barriers to renting a unit. Um, but that's also going to vary depending on each individual family circumstance. Not every family has the same financial barrier. So under the CMRS, each family will be eligible for flexible financial support, and that's intended to decrease their financial barriers of moving. So, for example, if the family needs assistance paying for an application fee, the program could help cover uh, that cost for the family. So that's sort of the logic that you see here, an issue area, the activity or, uh, or the set of service or policy that the uh, comprehensive mobility related services will implement. And then the um, sort of outcome that we expect from that service or policy. So this is a theory of change that we use to help figure out what the comprehensive mobility related services would be. And then the next slides I'm going to cover very briefly exactly what the full set of services are that are going to be offered to families participating in the demonstration. So, 
So my apologies again, as I know this is another dense slide and I'm just going to take a moment here to plug our webinar on July 8th, which is going to talk about these services in much more depth. It will be broader than what exactly the services are in the community choice demonstration. It's going to be about mobility related services generally. But what you see on the screen here is generally what people think of when they think of a mobility program services or a comprehensive set of services. This is sort of the, the, the kitchen sink of the types of services that uh, mobility programs typically offer. Um, but what this slide is showing here is the seven main phases of services families in the program will receive. Let me make sure that that's, yeah, seven phases. So these are specifically targeted to address barriers that we identified earlier to the extent possible. And so first, um, the family gets enrolled into the study through an informed consent process. You can see that, that, that being represented here in the yellow. Um, so families are getting uh, recruited into the study and then they're getting enrolled into the study through an informed consent process. And then they're either randomly assigned to the treatment group, which receives the CMRS services, or to the control group, which receives business as usual HCV program services and no special CMRS services. So families assigned to the treatment group then work with the services staff and their first activity is an in-depth pre-move appointment that focuses in on the family's goals, their neighborhoods of interest and any potential barriers and a plan to address those barriers. And then during the next phase, the family preparation phase, the family can attend workshops or referrals to help address those barriers to leasing. So they're working through what their plan is and thinking about um, getting ready, taking the steps to get ready to uh, start searching for a unit. And so when the family is ready to start searching for a unit, the program is going to provide specific unit referrals to them. They're also available to help, uh, take families to visit available units. Um, <clears throat> The program also will be doing pretty extensive landlord outreach and recruitment um, to find landlords and units to make available for uh, program participants. The program also is going to have this flexible family financial assistance of up to $750 to help with application fees, transportation costs, and other expenses that a family might need assistance with to remove that barrier uh, for moving. Um, the program is also going to have a signing bonus for landlords, as well as the ability to pay for security deposits and a damage mitigation fund. So once a family has found a unit, the inspection and leasing process should be expedited to help ensure the family gets leased up and that the landlord is encountering as little friction as possible working with the voucher program. And after the family leases, then the program also will be offering post move services to help uh, help ensure that the family adjusts okay to their new neighborhood. So again, we'll talk a lot more about this on July 8th, um, where we have more time dedicated to talk specifically about the services being offered. So um, we're spending a lot of time with the PHAs planning this program and funding research, and we are really hopeful that we're going to learn a lot from it and um, also be able to share those lessons learned um, along the way and not just at the end when we publish a final study. So it's um, our hope that this year we're going to make uh, many of the materials demonstration PHAs are using to implement their services available. Um, broadly, they'll be adjusted to not be so specific to the community choice demonstration, but that we um, that our technical assistance provider has done a really great job at working with sites to create a pretty um, robust set of materials and trainings, and we want to make that available to the broader housing authority community. Um, so we are hoping to make um, as many materials as possible available as soon as we can. And we're also then hoping to develop some training modules on how to implement those materials. And um, I'd really like to have some of our demo PHAs available on webinars to talk with other PHAs that might be interested in adopting mobility programs. 
So we don't know exactly what, <laughs> what these program materials and trainings are gonna look like or exactly when they're gonna be made available, but we are planning um, to make all of this available um, as soon as we can and um, just know that it is very much in, in the works and something we were pretty excited about being able to share um, broadly with others. And of course, we'll have uh, results from the independent research evaluation. So first, uh, the evaluator is gonna be preparing a rapid cycle evaluation analysis. So they'll be looking at just the first uh, year, year and a half of implementation to make some recommendations um, about how, how the study initially went to think about what might need to be in the selective mobility related services. Um, and we are planning to incorporate any lessons learned from that into implementation. So we are able to make mid course, uh, adjustments to the demonstration that we're pretty excited about the flexibility. And I think also that rapid cycle evaluation can help inform other mobility programs or other future HUD funding about mobility as well. And then a good bit down the road, there will be a final report that looks at the total demonstration and how um, effective and cost effective the services that were being offered are helping voucher families with children access areas of opportunity. So our main research objective is really to figure out are the set of services that are being offered effective at helping voucher families with children access areas of opportunity. That's our number one sort of research charge. And we will be able to learn that um, in the, the final report that will be published by the evaluator. Um, no. All right, so that is the conclusion of my um, prepared uh, presentation. I am going to see if there are any questions in the chat um, to see if we have any, and if not, um, I don't see any questions at this point in time. So I will just close with some reminders about our upcoming webinars and um, where to access them. Um, okay, there is a question in the chat. And Brendan, I was gonna see, I'm not sure I can see everything, but were you able to post the links to the um, training and resources website and to the community choice demonstration website? Yes, I posted them, but I can post them again. No, that's all right. I think I might not be able to see everything. So if I miss a question, let me know. But the one, um, sorry, the one question I see is there a set percentage point above FMR that we are looking at? And um, the answer to that is no. Um, we did not set any hard and fast rules regarding FMRs. Uh, we simply said that PHAs need to have adequate payment standards and opportunity areas. And that's because we're looking at a really um, diverse group of PHAs and what the FMR is in one place might be more, might be closer to market rents than it is in another location. And so what we've asked each site to do is really take a look at the small area FMRs, take a look at the flexibility to go up to 120% of FMR under this um, streamlined waiver notice that we have out and be really thoughtful about whether those dollar amounts are going to help families access areas of opportunity or whether we need to consider some other alternatives. And so sites are um, have really thoughtfully engaged in that process and are um, they're using a different uh, what's the right word, a variety of ways to make sure that their payment standards are adequate in opportunity areas. And they're also, um, you know, we just don't know what uh, a lot of these places have not necessarily targeted opportunity areas so specifically before. And so we'll need experience to see whether these rents truly are adequate or whether we need to make some adjustments. And so we're um, working really closely to, to make sure that those rents are adequate, but also recognize that um, the data <laughs> is, uh, on rents is not not the best and that rents are changing so quickly right now that we might need to uh, make adjustments over it. And so we're not trying not to set arbitrary uh, standards at this point. 
um, but the sites really are working hard to make sure the runs are adequate. Um, let's see. Let's see. So we received a question about um, their PHA is interested in applying for the next round of funding. Will the requirements be the same? Um, do we need to adopt the same admin policies as stated earlier? And I'm really glad you asked that question. I probably should have uh, looped back to that. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm sorry for the flashing screens here. Um, so I'm going to take us back to the 22 appropriations bill language here. And so these are what HUD, ha this is the, what Congress said HUD has to do. So HUD has to make the money available for mobility related services that are modeled after the services provided in connection with the demo. And that we have to give preference to PHAs on a competitive basis. I'm sorry, we have to award the funding on a competitive basis and give preference to PHAs with high concentrations of voucher families with children residing in high poverty neighborhoods. So those are the broad parameters that HUD has to follow. And beyond that, HUD has not started drafting the NOFO. So um, I can't say whether the requirements will be the same. Um, I can't say what the definition of opportunity area would be or what administrative policies um, you, you would have to adopt for the NOFO. Um, we are going to start drafting that in the next couple of months. And the NOFO will include guidance on what your PHA has to do. Um, but at this point in time, we don't have any of those parameters beyond what is here. Um, so I really encourage you all to, even if you can't make it, we're, we're hoping to just make these recordings broadly available so folks that couldn't make today are able to listen to this later. Um, so the services have to be modeled after the mobility demo services it doesn't say they have to be exactly the same, um, but we would encourage you to to take a listen in that to understand a little bit better at least what the demo services are, as that is um, one of the requirements that the the twenty two nofo uh, services should be modeled after the demonstration. It doesn't say they have to be exactly the same though. I'm so sorry that was sort of a cagey answer to your question, um, but we don't know. Uh, but the mobility, um, the the old notice is online if you want to see how we handled it in the past. But I will say that the research evaluation and the statute creating the demonstration really, uh, there were a lot of parameters required there. And so you'll see that reflected in the notice. And we um, don't have those same constraints here for this NOFO. So, you know, just read it with that in mind. All right. Um, are there any other questions that anyone wants to put in the uh, chat? Well, if not, um, I will thank you all for being here. So sorry that this got rescheduled and kind of sandwiched in here on a very busy post holiday day. We appreciate your time, um, especially appreciate your interest in housing mobility. And we look forward to um, seeing you on a future webinar in the series. Thank you so much. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.